Many thanks. First, I'd like to give my thanks to Professor Midel and uh, the recent GLOBE team for hosting and organizing this event in this really beautiful atmosphere here at the Tagungslounge. Uh, for me, as an ordinary uh, German uh, jurist, it is of uh, particular interest and uh, a great pleasure to exchange views with what we call neighboring disciplines, in particular history and global studies. This is interest is a direct link to our speaker, Sebastian Gerig, who is one of the not so many historians that do research on legal topics and actively seek exchange with legal scholars. Sebastian is what one might rightly call a German-British historian. He obtained a master's degree in historical studies from the University of Cambridge before returning to Germany and completing his doctorate in modern history at the University of Heidelberg. Subsequently, he taught at University College London, University of Oxford, before, before become, becoming a senior lecturer, which is his current position, at the University of Roehampton in London. His re research focuses on themes in modern and contemporary history that place the history of Germany, or the two Germanies, into its wider international and global contexts. He has worked on competing ideological ideas and the politics of law and human rights during the Cold War era, the clash of ideologies of law within the United Nations, citizenship rights and freedom of movement, sovereignty doctrines in the 20th century, cultural diplomacy and conflicts over German cultural sovereignty during this very Cold War era. In 2021, Sebastian published his first book, and I really advertising it here, his first book with a telling title, Legal Entanglements, Law, Rights, and a Battle for Legitimacy in Divided Germany. The book is a groundbreaking contribution to the study of modern legal, modern German legal and constitutional history, and has received broad attention not only in the historical, but also in the legal academic community. Sebastian presents Germany as kind of an exemplary case of a divided nation divided into new two new states during the Cold War, the Federal Republic of Germany, the FRG, and the German Democratic Republic, the GDR. The two st German states were politically separated, but still entangled by law, in particular by citizenship law, a topic with which Sebastian will elaborate next week in German for those who, who are not so very familiar with the English lang language as myself. Um, at the law faculty on the 19th of April at 6 p.m., you are all warmly invited to this event, which uh, will take place here in the Burgstraße 21 in Leipzig. Today, Sebastian will take a more comprehensive and global perspective on divided nations during the Cold War era. In his book, he repeatedly indicates that apart from Germany, there are other cases worthwhile examining, especially in Asia, with its divided nations, China, Korea, and at least temporarily, Vietnam. If you follow the news about the current political developments in Asia, you will hardly object that this field, is, uh, field of research is as topical as history can possibly be. While divided Korea has been a constant concern in international politics for decades now, the conflict between the two Chinas, or the two Chinese states, is on the verge of turning into a major global crisis. The battle for legitimacy between the People's Republic and the Republic of China, the latter better known as Taiwan, has survived the Cold War period and appears to be reaching a new level of confrontation these days. I'm convinced that Sebastian's lecture will provide us with an analytical framework that helps better understand what is actually going on between separate states, separate new states in divided nations. Sebastian, many thanks for accepting our invitation to give the first GLOBE lecture at Recent GLOBE. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost to uh, uh, Matthias Medell and Fabian Michel for the uh, kind invitation, uh, to Roman Kravilitsky for the organization and everyone else who was involved behind the scenes. Uh, it was a pleasure just arriving here and not having to worry about, about anything. And, and last but not least to all of you for giving up your time. Uh, late in, in the afternoon. I, I appreciate it. So let me begin with a short story from May 1962. Uh, almost a year after German division had been cemented by the Berlin Wall, uh, when the German ambassador stationed in Colombo cabled back to Bonn 
He reported that the contender for the next presidency of the General Assembly and official observer for Ceylon at the United Nations in New York, Gunapala Malala Sekera, who you hopefully see here, had recently been elected chairman of the 16-member committee of the United Nations for information from non-self-governing territories. In this capacity, the prolific UN diplomat suggested a de facto official acknowledgement of all states repre uh, representing so-called divided nations. He included the divided Germany and Berlin on his list of divided countries alongside South Vietnam and Laos. Malala Sekera endorsed the argument that only official UN recognition of all independent states and territories could eventually lead to unification. The West German ambassador pointed to Malala Sekera's previous diplomatic posts in Moscow in particular, where he established relations uh, between Ceylon and the People's Republic of China, uh, <clears throat> Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, and later posts in Warsaw, Budapest and Bucharest. These close ties to the socialist bloc, the report insinuated, marked him as a supporter of the German Democratic Republic's attempt to reach international recognition, so to speak, through the back door at the United Nations. Scholarship on the Cold War, or on Cold War German-German relations has long acknowledged the impact of Ostpolitik uh, negotiations on global diplomacy in the late 60s and early 1970s. Especially work edited by Carol Fink and Bernd, uh, Bernd Schaefer and others has shown the effects of German-German diplomacy on Cold War politics internationally. However, long before the late 1960s, and I'm, that's what I'm hoping to suggest to you uh, today, uh, German division had become part of international conflicts over post-imperial sovereignty. These global conflicts and their impact on both German states <clears throat> is uh, nowhere more evident than in the field of international law and sovereignty doctrine, on which I will concentrate in the following. Viewed from this perspective, German-German conflicts over national division did not only impact on other parts of the world between 1969 and 1974, but were in fact shaped already by conflicts over post-colonial partitions and Cold War conflicts over national divisions uh, around the world long before the tumultuous years of Ostpolitik. Malala Sekera's statement from 1962 posed a grave threat to West German legal and political frameworks of national division. Decolonization had put the recognition of the right of national self-determination of peoples and their sovereignty of, and the sovereignty of former colonies at the core of first League of Nations and after 1945 United Nations debates. It was no coincidence that a UN observer and official diplomat from the global south with close ties to socialist states, included the divided Germany and Berlin under allied control into his list of non-representative territories. The GDR government had started to engage in anti-racial discrimination solidarity campaigns only recently around the world uh, and at home. Anti-apartheid activism especially became a vehicle for the GDR leadership to generate diplomatic support in Asia and Africa for its own claim to sovereignty, now framed in new legal arguments concerning an East German right of self-determination, territorial integrity, and international uh, recognition of that East German sovereignty. This new type of legalist language linking East German demands to rhetoric of anti-colonial movements and decolonized states the GDR leadership hope would break West German dominance in describing a German division and sovereignty in international politics, which had been established after 1945 when the US and the West and Western states dominate international organizations into the 1950s and early 1960s. So it was in this particular context that Malala Sekera intervened in German Cold, uh, Cold War debates. The East German leadership fashioned the GDR now in third world logics of non-represented territories and equated the East German situation with the position of decolonized, yet still internationally non-recognized countries. This shift in legal language, however, went deeper than mere semantics. The GDR leadership tasked its legal and foreign policy experts with designing a comprehensive counter model to traditional German ideas of sovereignty rooted in ideas of the nation and folk. Ethnicity, or now in UN terminology, nationality, 
have provided legitimacy for claims to unifying Germans in a nation state since the early 19th century. Against this tradition, the East German, uh, or the East, the East German government now put an East German people at the heart of its bid for international recognition. The legitimacy of the East German state and its claim to sovereignty, so the argument went, <clears throat> was now grounded in, an un in the anti-fascist and anti-racist nature of socialist society and its citizenry rather than ethnicity. The community of citizens of the GDR was put at the center of these claims to sovereignty, no longer exclusively ethnic arguments. With this move, the SAD leadership maneuvered the question of German post-Second World War sovereignty into the middle of both conflicts over post-colonial sovereignty, as well as comparable cases of national division at the front lines of the Cold War in Asia. In my talk today, in what follows, I will try, uh, try and trace the origins of political languages of national division in newly emerging states after 1945. While treating Germany and the end, uh, after the end of the Second World War as a particular case, I hope to show the German, German conflict over a divided nation uh, encompassing new states, hence the title, uh, formed part of this wider international uh, uh, conflict over political transi tra transitions out of war, and in some cases, colonial control, in which these specific German demands were inscribed throughout the period of German national division. Um, before I go deeper into the history of these conflicts, please allow me a, a word or two with, uh, uh, about uh, debates within expert circles on sovereignty around 1945 to set the scene. German-German clashes over sovereignty unfolded against the backdrop of a particular post-war shift towards frameworks of global governance rooted in new languages of equality. While European colonial rule put such a scholarly and political shift into sharp relief at the time, American Cold War politics gave rise to political realism and decisively shaped debates on politics of sovereignty in Western countries and also for a time in the emerging United Nations. In 1948, Hans J. Morgenthau formulated a seemingly simple truth in the pages of the Columbia Law Review. A leading proponent of the realist project, he stated that, quote, sovereignty of the same territory cannot reside simultaneously in two different authorities. That is, sovereignty is indivisible, end of quote. Shortly after the end of the Second World War, Morgenthau articulated an opinion that was universally accepted amongst Western uh, experts of international law. Since the turn of, uh, to the 20th century, Lasse Oppenheim and others had argued that state sovereignty was essential for the recognition of other sovereign states and membership in the so-called family of nations. At that time, however, this family still only included so-called civilized nations and excluded colonial peoples. While Western legal scholars fought over the relationship between the sovereignty of the state and the institutions that govern said state and exercise power within a state, or the level uh, of sovereignty of federal states uh, within uh, a nation, uh, or, or the division of sovereign powers between the executive and the legislative, the idea that sovereignty to in the international sphere was indivisible remained largely uncontested until the mid-century. Despite anti-colonial challenges to Western views that refused to grant full sovereignty to colonial peoples, this hegemonic uh, opinion among Western international law scholars was not altered until the end of the Second World War. The state and not people, and that's important, remained firmly established at the, uh, as the central object of international sovereignty and subject of international law. In the same year, 1948, in which Morgenthau reaffirmed the idea of indivisible, indivisible international sovereignty over territory, Leo Gross set this notion in stone for the nascent academic discipline of international relations, which was on the rise in the period of academic enthusiasm over, for globalism after the end of the Second World War. Commemorating the uh, 300th anniversary of the Peace of Westphalia, Gross's reading of the implications rather than the actual terms of the peace settlement of the Thirty Years' War in 1648 
promoted nation state sovereignty and sovereign equality as the new central criteria in the organization of international affairs. Such notions obviously papered over the realities of empire at the time in ele elevating a universal ideology of sovereignty, if you will, and, uh, and grounded this new framework in the myth of a century old Westphalian state system shaped by sovereignty, territoriality, and equality of states, uh, as well as non-intervention, which obviously at the time is much more a perspective and a, a way forward, a utopian vision for the future after the war than the actual reality people uh, live in at the time. So this was an endorsement of nation state sovereignty as the new universal standard on which future international politics should rest. Yet international politics still looked rather different. German division uh, only one year later in 19. 49, the divisions of China and Korea, as well as the partition of former colonies that accompanied their independence, complicated such theories of individual, indivisible sovereignty rooted in ideas of nationality uh, until the mid-1950s. In the hegemonic logics of Western international law and international relations theory, uh, of the early decades after the Second World War, only one government should represent one nationality. Crucially, this framework was only inscribed in the uh, now in inscribed in the institutional logics of the emerging United Nations. This divergence between the theory and reality of sovereignty triggered an intense politi politicization of sovereignty as part of the Cold War between the two German states that first fiercely competed over the question as to which state legit, uh, uh, legitimately I'm sorry, represented German sovereignty. This conflict began to affect broader international law debates on the nature of sovereignty only once the GDR leadership decided to break away from German legal tradition and when it began to advocate an independent East German sovereignty from the turn of the 50s into the 1960s. Such East German arguments for a legitimate division of countries after 1945 clashed with the underlying principles that now already structured UN membership politics. The UN mantra of one nation, one seat had quickly brought, brought to light the divergences in what the historian James S. Sheehan has called, quote, the relationship between the abstract and the concrete in sovereign theory and sovereign practice. At the same time, it foreshadowed a crisis in notions of territoriality and sovereignty established through the control of bordered political spaces as the framework for national and ethnic identity. States that saw themselves as representing a divided nation beyond its own borders, thus contradicted the realist project of sovereign equality that had been inscribed into UN politics and international law frameworks in the first decades of the war. Cold War politics therefore quickly created hierarchies between conflicts labeled increasingly as partitions in contrast to divisions. These difference in, uh, differences in language shaped the trajectories of conflicts on the ground in the decades to come and would create their own structural logics that played out on the ground in the future. Contemporaries had still discussed the issue of so-called population exchanges in Europe, Palestine, and India in the mid-1940s as connected issues under the label of petitions. Yet the acceleration of ideological conflicts between the wartime allies after 1947 quickly promoted, uh, uh, promoted uh, or prompt and uh, promoted new political languages and prompted political observers and legal scholars to discuss the issue of German sovereignty and conflict uh, and conflicts along Cold War front lines in Asia under the new language of division. While partition was meant to signal conflict solution, division perpetuated notions of unresolved disputes. The UN's direct involvement into the Korean War especially made Korean division after the armistice of 1953 a hot button issue within the General Assembly. With the end of the Korean War, three divided countries had emerged in international politics along the, in the West at least, so-called iron and bamboo curtains. And that was obviously Germany, uh, China, and Korea. Uh, 
while international organizations retreated from the People's Republic of China and the UN did not play a direct role in the reconstruction of Germany, as was discussed very briefly in the late 40s, the US backed both the Federal Republic and the Republic of China's entry into international organizations after the escalation of Cold War conflicts. To bolster the ROC's position, not just in the UN, where the ROC obviously, uh, and Fabian has mentioned that, took, uh, took up the Security Council seat and General Assembly representation, representation of China, but also in its associated as, uh, organizations, which are more important than we might uh, often think uh, now, especially UNESCO, which uh, the ROC joined in July 1950 already. Local opposition of the Hungarian, Czechoslovakian, and Indian representatives could not prevent this American-backed success. From 1950 to 1952, the Federal, Federal Republic gained entry to the Food and Agricultural uh, Organization, the FOA, and was awarded official UN observer status. The direct US-Soviet standoff in divided Germany obviously prevented full West German membership of the UN at the time, but official accreditation as an observer state representing Germany, not the Federal Republic uh, alone, now barred the GDR from official UN politics as a second state representing Germany in the mid-century logics of UN membership of one nation, one seat. With the exclusion of the PSC and the GDR from UN affairs, the Beijing and East Berlin government started to explore different ways in trying to push their way into international politics. While GDR diplomats and representatives sometimes literally uh, bogarted the doors of UN meetings in Geneva and New York in the 50s and 60s and demanded entry, the PSC Ministry of Foreign Affairs turned down an offer by the Czechoslovakian government to put forward a motion that demanded that representatives of the Chinese Communist Party should be allowed to participate as observers at UNESCO's ninth general Con conference in New Delhi in 1956 to open up a pathway into uh, UN associated organizations for the PSC. The CCP leadership refused to participate in events that included ROC representatives, uh, a policy that continues to this day. In this, the Beijing government decided on a similar non recognition policy of the ROC that the Federal Republic pursued uh, against the GDR in the 1950s. In the legal world, this bias towards Western dominance continued inside and outside of the UN. In the decade after 1949, the East German state therefore focused on revolutionary language following the official announcement of building socialism in 1952, instead of legal or legalistic concepts uh, of sovereignty. In the meantime, West German legal and political elites aided by American dominance in the UN and other international bodies shaped interpretations of Germany's post-war status uh, in the international arena. Legal experts within the Bonn government worked together with, uh, with a cross-partisan coalition of leading law scholars, such as Rudolf Laun, Adolf Arndt, uh, and Ulrich Scheuner. They framed German national division in a legal language uh, that was meant to deny East German statehood altogether. Their central argument stipulated that a unified legal sovereignty of the German Reich, quote unquote, in its borders of 1937, i.e. before Nazi territorial expansion, uh, but after the rise of the Nazis to power, obviously, had survived the unconditional surrender of May 1945, at least in international law. The foundation of a West German state and government was seen as a separate second state sovereignty, that the government in Bonn represented alongside this sovereignty of the Reich, which often was also internationally called the sovereignty of Germany to make it more palatable for foreign ears. In other words, the legal core understanding of the West German state rested on the assumption that German sovereignty was in fact not, never divi uh, not divided and had never been divided, uh, but that the Bonn government was only obstructed by Soviet force through the continued occupation of their zone of the occupation from representing it um, in full. This West German agenda of enshrining a continued existence of unified German sovereignty into international politics instrumentalized legal understandings governing the UN at the time. The principle, as I already mentioned, of one nation, one seat, linked now nationality to territoriality. Um, uh, represented 
only by a single government. The West German uh, government profited from shared interests with the Republic of China, therefore, obviously, in the early decades of the Cold War. Chiang Kai-shek's government on Taiwan, now a member of the Security Council, endorsed a one-China paradigm alongside West German calls for one Germany paradigms in international legal politics in particular. As long as both countries remained in the same Cold War camp and Western powers retained their dominance in framing international legal standards at the UN, so politicians in Bonn and Taipei thought, their hold on international representations of what China and Germany uh, were in international law should remain firm. Yet once the People's Republic of China had acquired atomic weapons in October 1964 and decolonized states began to turn the tide of uh, the Western voting majority within the UN General Assembly, West German and Taiwanese hegemony over defining German and Chinese sovereignty in international affairs would slowly crumble. The People's Republic made inroads into UN politics from the early 1960s. The growing number of decolonized states countries that had acceded to UN membership transformed rights debates in particular in the corridors of the UN headquarters in New York and Geneva. After long retreat from all German frameworks during the 1950s, the East German government at the same time surrendered uh, the competition for the legitimate representation of the unified German sovereignty uh, that it had long but in a futile manner thought uh, the West German government over in the 1950s. Weakened by the uprising of East Germans in 1953, the East German leadership moved on to new legal semantics of national division. This remained a clandestine project until the building of the Berlin Wall in 1961. Until the uh, mid-60s, the GDR government then had difficulties finding a message that would garner support outside of the socialist bloc for this new legal vision of a legitimately divided nation. Yet only by rallying enough international support behind East German uh, interpretations of nationalism, uh, of national division, that much was clear, uh, could that project have uh, any impact. So GDR international law experts such as Peter Alfons Steininger determined uh, that wet the West German position on German sovereignty had to be attacked in the international arena backed by a new coalition of Asian and African support. Uh, so at the time when the PSC uh, jockeyed for third world support for its claim uh, on Chinese sovereignty by completely denying the ROC's um, uh, well claim to Chinese representation in international affairs, uh, which mirrored, as I said, the, the West German Hallstein doctrine, and at, on top of that attacked the Soviet Union's leadership uh, of socialist countries after Sino-Soviet split, East German ideologues went another way and instead appealed to newly independent states to support East German claims for independence in the new language uh, of decolonization, first and foremost centered on a right of self-determination of peoples. The, uh, the ensuing conflict within the UN over divided countries galvanized ideological tensions over the legal principles of sovereignty and self-determination from these days onwards. The Indian government in particular had been the first prime advocate of PSC membership over ROC representation in the 1950s. After the Bandung Conference in 55, during which non-aligned states had outlined principle for an alternative framework uh, of global governance, the Indian UN delegation submitted annual requests to the General Assembly, demanding that the question of Chinese representation should be officially debated on the floor, which was not permitted at the time. Uh, and the General Assembly would evade this issue twice uh, through American maneuvering, actually, until it was first officially discussed in September of 1958. The US delegation immediately pushed back and rejected the Indian proposal with the support of Australia, Ecuador, El Salvador, the UK, the ROC, obviously, um, while Ceylon, where Malala Sakira hailed from, um, Czechoslovakia, Indonesia, Nepal, Panama, and the Soviet Union turned up in support uh, that the Chinese question needed, in fact, to be debated as a prime international issue at the time. While the US still ultimately prevailed in the late 50s, the Western alliance had to fend off several amendments and additional resolution drafts in the process, 
Uh, and there were already cracks visible on the Western side as well. The Irish and the Swedish delegation voiced veiled criticism of the US uh, position on the floor of a complete non-recognition of, uh, of the PSC and revealed uh, that there were doubts uh, emerging in the West as well. An official discussion of the Chinese issue, uh, issue would uh, by no means represent a victory for communism, the Swedish argued in particular, but rather it would stand for a vital principle of democratic uh, tradition, that of free debate. Decolonization now began to threaten Western dominance in UN politics more and more openly with the admission of a, a, a sizable number of newly independent states in the year 1960 alone. This led to institutional maneuvering on the issue of national division in particular. The US now could no longer prevent the issue from being officially discussed uh, within the institution. It was in this context that diplomats from the global south, such as Malala Sekera, uh, with whom I began, uh, connected Asian and European national divisions in UN politics. Uh, on the 27th of January 1964, the West German diplomat Eleanor von Puttkammer alerted her superiors uh, in quite uncertain terms uh, to recent events in the General Assembly in a confidential memorandum for the Foreign Office. In charge of monitoring UN politics and international organizations, von Puttkammer had closely followed the recent major turnaround uh, in French Cold War politics. Uh, and that might be quite topical in, uh, given what we saw and heard the last couple of days. The French government had opened official diplomatic relations uh, with the CCP government on the German Mao Zedong in Beijing. Von Puttkammer sensed a mounting danger that key allies of the Bonn government uh, <clears throat> uh, could change sides uh, in the China issue uh, as well. So in the report, she claimed to quote, uh, there was a danger that German division might turn in German partition very soon. Nowhere was this danger more acute uh, than in international law circles. Putkama outlined the potential for a seismic shift in international politics, putting the West German government on the defensive. While quote, there exist no formal legal parallels between the relationship of the Federal Republic and the SPZ. She still used uh, uh, the acronym of the Soviet occupied, uh, occupation zone here on the one hand, and Formosa and mainland China on the other. She argued uh, in the typical West German legal and diplomatic language of the time, quote, this doesn't change the fact that surprisingly many governments make precisely this comparison and measure the problem of divided Germany with the same parameters than the China question, unquote. The French now had made it official that they could live with two officially acknowledged Chinese states. If both Chinese states would ever accede and ascend to UN membership, it would be almost untenable to speak of German division uh, instead of two independent states. It was pivotal Puttkammer concluded that the Bonn government pushed for the represent representation of only one Chinese state within the UN. Otherwise, claims to representing German sovereignty in its entirety and beyond the borders of the Federal Republic in open neglect of the GDR's independent statehood would simply evaporate within the UN. In response, the incoming head of the West German observer delegation at the UN, Sigismund von Braun, immediately requested a meeting with the UN legal department. The UN legal counsel, Konstantinos Stavropoulos, confirmed that the UN bureaucracy saw the French move to recognize the PSC as a uh, breakdown of a united and uniform Western position. Yet the UN's legal team had not identified any movement on what Stavropoulos called Franco-Africans. This means Africans who had lived under uh, French colonial rule until recently to adjust the position of newly independent former French colonies in the China question. He nonetheless saw the writing on the wall. He confided in von Braun that he thought the US strategy of simply increasing the voting barrier to discuss the issue uh, of Chinese representation in the uh, German Assembly was misguided. That was, that's what the US had done all the time. So it went from, it went from a, a simple majority to a two third majority to a certain number of votes that were needed to, to bring the, the issue to the floor uh, for discussion at all. 
the two China paradigm had gained ground and Stavropoulos sensed that very clearly uh, within delegation offices around UN headquarters at the time. Uh, he saw the US's uh, game uh, Sim or the US strategy as wasting precious time in securing continued membership for the ROC on the one hand, as long uh, and potentially allowing PSC membership, as long as the US delegation still had a dominant position within the UN. As long as the Soviet Union only reluctantly peddled the PRC's position, uh, but had no real interest to share, quote, the vanguard position among the suppressed peoples, uh, unquote, within the UN after the Sino-Soviet split, the US and the Western coalition should come to an agreement with Moscow uh, that allowed membership of both Chinese states to solve the issue. Stavropoulos made it clear that the law could only follow politics here as, quote, a solid legal solution seems unlikely, so the Gordian knot needs to be severed with the political sword, unquote. Western diplomats now, uh, West German diplomats now swarmed uh, out in a fact-finding mission to gauge the impact of the issue of Chinese sovereignty and international representation on German division. Uh, they were not the only ones upset with the French government at the time. Uh, the South Vietnamese government in Saigon sharply criticized uh, the French recognition of the PSC, fearing for their own position against the communist North. Uh, when, the French when a French delegation visited Bonn for regular consultations, um, uh, West German Foreign Office uh, diplomats took the issue up with their French counterpart, uh, Manash. Given France's colonial history in Vietnam, Manash claimed uh, in response, trying to calm, calm uh, West German nerves, uh, uh, France was only interested in maintaining economic relationships uh, to Vietnam, but had no uh, uh, intention and plan or plans to acknowledge either North Vietnam or, or North Korea. Based on the Geneva Treaties of 1954, uh, relations, especially with, with Vietnam, should simply continue uh, as they were at the time. Yet the French suggestions that Vietnam could be united as a neutral country that went along with these uh, propositions uh, raised renewed alarm bells in Bonn because obviously that these suggestions raised the ghost of the 52 Stalin notes uh, and a neutral uh, but unified uh, Germany. So the West Germans impressed on their French counterparts uh, uh, that they should at least avoid any similar rhetoric in public in discussing divided countries and asked if they were if they would support efforts to ensure that neutral non-aligned countries, uh, in Africa and Asia would not establish relations to North Vietnam and North Korea, if at all possible. The similarity with the divided Germany could otherwise be, again, too obvious. To make the French position clear that the GDR was no sovereign state under international law, West German diplomats asked them to speak of China and Formosa instead of uh, two Chinas to avoid parallels to what they called the wrong term of two Germanys, that the GDR government was uh, using at the time. Politics and historical developments now openly became guiding arguments to make uh, a claim for differences in the legal nature of divided countries around the world. In March 1964, the West German UN observer delegation received new marching orders. In case the theory of two Chinese successor states uh, should be brought into continued contact, with the Soviet assertion of two German successor states of the German Reich, the Foreign Office instructed the UN observer delegation, the diplomats should highlight historical differences between the two cases, no longer legal arguments. The division of Germany occurred due to the uh, outside influence uh, of the Soviet Union and the Panko regime uh, remained a concealed Soviet puppet regime. In contrast, Chinese division had developed out of internal transformations and uh, was an outcome of civil war, so not an outcome of occupation as German division. Foreign office diplomats concluded that, quote, division into a Chinese and Formosan uh, state would be by far not as unnatural as tearing apart Germany, which is historically, culturally, and following the will of its population, a much more tightly formed entity, unquote. Moreover, geography and the separation of the ROC and the PSC by the Taiwan Strait uh, 
made division much more credible in the Chinese case than in the German case. The East German government hoped to exploit this moment of international shifts at the same time. In 1966, Walter Ulbricht famously submitted the GDR's official application for UN membership. The GDR application now openly played on the trope of universality to legitimize UN membership, similarly to Malala Sequeira's arguments about universality of representation. Since its foundation, uh, this had been the promise of the UN all along that all independent states uh, should be represented uh, in the organization. Uh, and so uh, Ulrich claimed uh, that the GDR example also showed the, uh, that there, isn't, there was an independent state uh, that had the legitimacy and the right to be admitted. When the human rights uh, covenants were opened for signature in the same year, the issue of universal represent representation of all states really moved forward uh, within international politics, but also within the UN. Albania, Algeria, Cambodia, Congo, Cuba, Guinea, Mali, Romania, and Syria tabled a renewed request to debate Chinese representation. So that just to show you that the, the list of countries trying to push the Chinese issue into international politics grows and grows. For the first time, the principle of universality was now put front and center in explaining why the PSC had to be recognized as a UN member. So it was no longer about division and how division had occurred, but it was simply the UN is an organization for all sovereign states, the PSC is sovereign, hence it should be a member state. Um, and above all, the uh, PSC's position as a nuclear power meant that major regional international issues could no longer be solved easily uh, without the, uh, uh, the Beijing government. So in, in terms of peace, the peacekeeping mission of the UN, again, uh, skirting the PSC was no longer a viable um, option. In, in the West, and particularly in the US, legal experts such as Arthur Lawson now hinted that there was a danger of, the, uh, of an expulsion of the, R, uh, the ROC if no last minute package deal uh, could be agreed, which secured the representation of both Chinese state, uh, states. He had served in the Eisenhower government uh, and uh, later on uh, retired from politics on a professorship at Duke. If the ROC were to lose its seat, the government in Taipei had, no, uh, had to apply as a new member for membership again, and that obviously would spell the end of any realistic chance for readmission in Larson's view. It does was clear already in 1966 that the US and other Western governments had to find a way to make a deal with the Soviet Union and the PSC to allow, uh, to allow continued membership of the ROC. They uh, had not heeded Stavropoulos' earlier warning uh, when they still had much more cloud in the institution to secure Taiwanese membership. However, by the late 60s, the socialist bloc in several African and Asian uh, countries had already pushed uh, to forward a much more radical position on the Taiwanese or Chinese issue. The PSC had always made clear that it would, uh, under no circumstances, accept the notion of two Chinese states. The PSC Foreign Minister Jenny uh, now even demanded uh, the, fun uh, the fundamental reform of the UN as a precondition of PSC membership in which, quote, the UN Charter should be reviewed and revised jointly by all countries, big and small, all independent states should be included in the United Nations and all imperialist puppets should be expelled." End of quote. The resolutions uh, condemning the PSC and North Korea as aggressors um, in the Korean War also needed to be revoked before the PSC would consider joining the organization. The, despite these radical demands, some observer also saw an opportunity to create a new forum uh, for Asian states to discuss ongoing conflicts as uh, no platform at the time really existed that included both China's, Korea's, and Vietnam's. Although expected to be disruptive, uh, even US uh, scholars such as Larson argued that PSC membership by now uh, would actually make the UN into a more credible and permanent framework to engage with the Beijing government. Conflicts over Chinese sovereignty and representation now reached boiling point at the UN. Political agendas openly dictated the classification of the legal intricacies of the China question. By 1968, supporters of the PSC again radicalized legal language, 
even further and accused a coalition around the US and the ROC of an illegal quarantine of Beijing. Supporters of the PSC now argued that there existed confusion over the distinction between a state and a government. While the Guomindang government had taken part in the foundation of the UN, the PSC actually represented Chinese nation and state. Thus, the PSC had the natural right to represent the whole of China internationally. The West German UN observer delegation in the meantime watched with increasing fear and horror uh, how the US government was forced to realize that its total non-recognition policy of the China issue had outlived its time and that very rapidly. By 1970, African supporters for the PSC's position and their, uh, and their determination to not be swayed by uh, development aid payments had really hardened. Um, more and more African states supported the admission of the PSC only, not both Chinese states any longer. The initially small coalition spearheaded by Albania and reluctantly supported by the socialist bloc had growing appeal within the Afro-Asian bloc in the UN at that time. Countries supporting the PSC now became bolder in their approach. Tunisia proposed a resolution that demanded that the, uh, sec uh, sec the Secretary General should be entrusted with the task of exploring solutions in the China issue. In other words, the UN should now act as an independent institution and no longer as a forum for membership states to solve international um, conflict. Uh, so now critics obviously argued that any two China concepts, whether they were politically or juridically founded, would be entirely unsound. In 1971, and I'm nearing the end of my story here, the dam finally broke. The US has, uh, was no longer able to use procedural rules to block the PSC's accession to UN membership. The General Assembly finally adopted famously Re Resolution 2758, which restored all rights of UN representation of the PSC and simultaneously expelled the ROC from all UN organizations on the 25th of October of 1971. The Security Council was for the first time outmaneuvered in such a crucial and far-reaching decision. Uh, on the 23rd of November 71, the PSC delegation first attended a Security Council meeting and completed the reversal of Chinese representation. The Western world and Western publics reacted with utter shock. In the historical moment of the PSC's UN admission, decolonization had actually turned the General Assembly into the decision-making body of the UN, uh, which is really a historical moment that has not reappeared ever since in that gravity. Um, so the, uh, the US administration finally acknowledged that it had come uh, it had to come to new arrangements with Beijing. And that then obviously feeds into the story of Kissinger's uh, secret visit to the PSC in the same year and the famous, famous visit of Nixon and the meeting of Nixon and Mao in 1972. In this international climate, West German legal experts on the other side of the world tried to adjust their sovereignty doctrine at the height of Ostpolitik negotiations, which were complicated enough. In the same year, 1971, the legal scholars Eberhard Menzel and Rudolf Geiger clashed in the pages of the Zeitschrift für Rechtspolitik over the, nation, over the nature of German sovereignty. Menzel, the director of the Institute for International Law at the University of Kiel, uh, outlined his view of German sovereignty, national division, and allied extraterritorial rights in Germany after 1945. A controversial figure due to his early career in the Third Reich, he bemoaned the Western Allies' acceptance of what he called the two-state theory that the GDR had advocated since the 1950s, or the late 1950s, I should say. He saw the Bonn government, uh, government's support for a so-called roof thesis, a Dachthese, of German sovereignty waning that postulated that this uniform, unified German sovereignty in succession of the Reich still existed if and only if at all in law. Menzel argued that this roof thesis had to be defended at all costs in Ostpolitik negotiations, as it outlined that the Bonn government exercised this all German sovereignty as well as West German sovereignty at the same time. In his view, uh, the Dachthese that allowed a complete rejection of the GDR's legitimate uh, statehood 
uh, needed to be maintained uh, at all costs, because otherwise the whole framework of West German foreign policy, but also legal foundations might break apart. Geiger, on the other hand, uh, uh, used international law and international legal debates to contradict Men Menzel's, in his eyes, outdated uh, view, and claimed that Ostpolitik could still maintain uh, the, the so-called double sovereignty uh, that the Federal Republic claimed. At the time, a judge at the highest state court in Munich, in uh, he outlined that, for example, India had signed the Versailles Treaty while still being part of the uh, British Empire. You see lawyers do that very, very often when they don't uh, have no solution in doctrine any longer. They try to search for historical examples, and that seemed to be the best at hand to explain double sovereignty in the new changed situation of the early 19th. 70s. So Geiger essentially ar argued that parts of a greater legal entity, or what he called it, Teilordnung, uh, could be fully recognized member of the international community at the one hand and still be seen as part of another higher level legal entity at the same time, i.e. there still is Germany somewhere out there in law. This scholarly exchange encapsulated how the politics of sovereignty surrounding German division had changed due to shifts elsewhere in UN debates on the sovereignty of divided nations. In projecting sovereignty beyond West German borders, in claiming to represent the sovereignty of the German Reich in its borders of 1937, as part of this double sovereignty I talked about, law and rights languages had been paramount for West German politics after 1949. While both Menzel and Geiger avoided direct references to the shifts in international controversies over the nature of legal and political sovereignty, um, in the late 60s, the exchange mirrored how the German tradition of Staatsrecht that provided legitimacy for Menzel's position and reading of German legal uh, sovereignty had come under pressure by global clashes over concepts of sovereignty and self-determination. Menzel wrote his article in the hope to return to the legal issue of German uh, that to return the main legal issue of German politics to save grounds of German Staatsrecht only. So after this branching out into international law, the last line to, of defense now is, well, all this international law doesn't apply. Let's go back to just German, i.e. West German law, to, to make our point stick. Uh, so the four allied uh, allies framework should govern German-German division from, from here on out. Yet time and poli international politics had already moved on. When the two German governments concluded their negotiations, the Bonn government only insisted on disagreement on the administration of German citizenship. When the, uh, when the PSC had secured that the China question remained focused on a one nation paradigm uh, after entering the UN in 1971, the two German states were admitted only to the UN in 1973 as independent sovereign nations after uh, law and history were firmly divided in how the UN views these issues from here on in. And that is that the German uh, issue could still be debated under legal frameworks, while the Chinese insisted that historically their case of division uh, remained unique and therefore the one China paradigm had to be, had to be maintained while they accepted a divided Germany. So I'm conscious that I probably way over time already. So let me just conclude with a, a couple of brief thoughts. Um, the policy of sovereignty that had been at play at the UN when it came to divided nations showed that the projection of sovereignty in international affairs heavily relied on political coalitions and was subject to shifts of international Cold War power relations. After the short moment in which the General Assembly became the decision-making body of the UN and altered Chinese representation in 1971, the brittle coalition between socialist bloc countries and African and Asian leaders who were at that point then much more focused on maintaining control and sovereignty rather than establishing self-determination rights and sovereignty broke apart again. The shift towards uh, economic power relations and third world demands for a new international economic order, as well as the separation of the UN's legal interpretation of China and Germany that I just outlined, finally made a session of both German states possible uh, and making the German case unique in uh, UN politics as well. While many observers had seen Chinese and German division as part of the same political and legal issue in UN politics in the 60s, 
the different historical trajectories that had led to division in China and Germany after 1945 now uh, de uh, determine different UN legal standards after 1971. The UN legal division uh, determined that the civil war in China that had led to division of the country in 49 and the breakup of Germany under Allied occupation ought to result in, in a different legal treatment of the issue of Chinese and German sovereignty. While the one China paradigm continues to drive conflicts between the PSC and the Republic of China, as we've seen in recent days, again, Ostpolitik treaties created the basis for UN representation of both German states. The moment of convergence that I try to uh, show to you in treating national divisions in Europe and Asia as a challenge to concepts of universal international sovereignty norms uh, of statehood now again gave way to special treatment of individual cases in international politics. Thank you very much. And thanks, Sebastian, for your intriguing uh, insights on these uh, real entanglements of Chinese and German history. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes for question and answers, so uh, you're warmly invited to use the microphone. Yes, thank you very much for the, the fascinating talk. Um, my question is very straightforward, and perhaps you already said it, and I, I just missed it because I was taking notes. But I was very interested in um, this sort of dam that broke when French leadership uh, first moved to recognize the PRC. And I wanted to know if you could elaborate on why that was, uh, what was their reasoning and motivation? Um, thank you. Um, uh, well, there, there are a couple of reasons there. I think that there are regional interests uh, which have to do with economic relations. Then obviously this is the, this, this, the, this is the time, the early 60s, when the French are uh, in real uh, cahoots with the Americans when it comes to NATO. Uh, politics and the nuclear umbrella in Europe. And, you know, there's this whole tension, would France drop out of NATO and uh, develop its own uh, nuclear deterrence? And it's in that context that the French develop or try to develop an independent French position to Cold War international issues to essentially gain distance to the Americans. Um, and in, in that context, obviously, France is no longer engaged in a uh, uh, in a war in Indochina uh, anymore, so that that interest is gone, uh, and it seems to be prudent uh, of people, diplomats in, in in Paris, and think that um, sensing that after the sign of Soviet split, maybe China could be split away from the Soviet Union to ease pressure on uh, on the Cold War front in Europe as well, which would be a friend, French interest to engage in, in in closer relationships with them, and then they at some point jump in in sixty four. Uh, and, and officially recognize the PSC as a as a state. I need to add on that. I, I wonder if there is also a French interest uh, in particular constellations of a divided nation. Uh, I mean, there is decolonization, and there is this very strange um, aspiration by those countries in Western Africa, forming later on La Francophonie not to split and separate from France, but to insist on being part of the French nation. So they had their own struggle with this principle. And is there any legal debate between French and German scholars on this issue? I mean, the Germans obviously have their Ostdeutschland problem mm -hmm. um, and, and the borders of 37, while they have in fact no colonial legacy any longer to discuss. Uh, on the other hand, you have the French and the British uh, discussing their very problematic, uh, you know, uh, question of how to run away uh, from colonialism. Um, and you would expect, and in your story, it looks as if all these countries were happy to be now separate, sovereign, etc. Mm -hmm. But obviously, this was not the case for all of them, uh, which was a pressing issue, I guess, for mm -hmm. the French elites, at least for those. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Obviously, I, I couldn't talk about all, the, all these connections uh, as well in in uh, overstaying my welcome in terms of time. Anyway, um, there is, uh, to, long story short, there is no open debate uh, between West German and French legal scholars, because what the West Germans actually for a long term insist on is, is essentially from that starting point of uh, sovereignty has survived the threshold of 45 from 37. Uh, what they desperately try to do is essentially govern German-German relations based on 
German legal tradition in a, in a Staatsrecht framework, which they treat as a separate tradition from French, British, and, and American uh, legal thinking. There is debate uh, on the foreign policy level, but then it's precisely about these issues of uh, a post openly post-colonial nation on the one hand, and uh, the West Germans who, who treat us as who treat that as a as a nationality uh, issue. In the though in the fifties, and that's a problem for the French again in quite unpalatable revanchist ways. So they they think about self determination in the fifties for a while, really in the sense of the nineteen thirties. So you have the West German government funding legal research institutes in Lüneburg, for example, uh, which essentially make the argument self determination. And the push of decolonization essentially will allow all Germans to be reunite, reunited in one country, which means basically, you know, the dream the Nazis once once had. So these people use that language, and that's where the French then draw the line as well. But they 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 don't talk comparatively. Thanks a lot for your interesting talk. Um, there is one thing that has always puzzled me from the point of international law: um, recognition is just a matter of politics, but not of law. So in terms of sovereignty, the GDR, at least in the year of 1961, definitely was a state and everything else was just a blatant lie. Um, but the Grundgesetz in its preamble enshrined this lie into constitutional law. Did this play a role in German discussions? Like, well, we have to lie because the Grundgesetz demands us to lie. Sorry for that. Um... Uh, you're obviously right, and uh, th that's really what I try to, to show in the book. That that kind of law is politics. That you can you can you can try to be as doctrinal as you like. It's simply about politics, um, uh, and I, I talk about that uh, quite extensively in the first chapters of the book. That um, for the West Germans, what they do in 49, 48, 49, when the Basic Law is drafted and passed by a lot of people who come out of the, the Third Reich bureaucracy and obviously have all these intentions uh, silently when they try to keep this, this idea of the, the Reich's uh, continued existence in law alive, that becomes more and more of a curse because it ties West German legal politics um, to this framework. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is then obviously that the Grundgesetz allows two options to enlarge its territory. One which is uh, used in the, in the Tsar case, which is basically a cession to an existing constitutional framework. And the other is uh, the Wiedervereinigungsparagraf, which is then not used, which is essentially the old German 19th century traditional way, uh, new political break, constitutional assembly, new constitution, new state. Um, now, by the 60s, the problem is that if that was were just politics, you could change your mind as you can in politics and just move on. But because it's legal politics, all these assumptions frame legislation. Uh, they seep into ordinary Germans' rights when it comes to accession, uh, accession to citizenship, when it comes to property rights, uh, when it comes to uh, marriage and, uh, and divorce. So this basic framework really structures uh, legal realities on the ground to the extent that it's not that it's not a flick of a switch anymore to say, well, that was useful in the 50s, it's really problematic in the 70s, let's just you know be done with it uh, and move on because it's it's a legal framework that seeps into legislation, is applied in court, results in verdicts that affect people's lives. Uh, and so they have real trouble in, in West Germany in the 70s and 80s to move beyond uh, that initial non-recognition within, within the law. Um, and they never really go away uh, in one area, and that is citizenship. So that that demand that West Germany would represent all Germans if they make it into uh, the free world uh, never go, goes away uh, for, for many intricate reasons uh, that I don't want to bore you with. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's essential. And I think that what's, that makes the law so interesting that everything that could be just a political story become social reality to the extent if it lasts long enough that you can't just, you know, change your mind again and have a new policy. And then it's a new world, a new day. Fascinating elaboration on what law actually is, because that I have to note, uh, because I can use it in the next lecture on jurisprudence, maybe. 
uh, well, it makes sense. It, it, it directly transforms into a social reality, and that's the, the very difference between, uh, you know, at least uh, national law, domestic law, and then international law. Um, my question relates, well, it's a bit of a silly question, is does size matter? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there an argument, a political or a legal argument, based on the on the sheer size of the People's Republic of China and Taiwan, on the other hand, and the GDR and the, uh, um, mm -hmm. and the Federal Republic, which are not really the same size, but if you add to the uh, to the um, to the to the GDR the former eastern part of Germany, which on your map was displayed as being mm -hmm. occupied by the Soviet Union or Poland, we are not so sure about that. Um, then you have half the size of Germany in its borders from 1973. So is there a, is, does this really matter? I mean, this sheer dimension of having this huge Chinese mainland state and this small island of Formosa or whatever they call it uh, in this diplomatic relations. And uh, on the other hand, having a, a divided Germany with, let's say, two parts which are almost the same size. Mm -hmm. um, I think I probably answer that best again uh, looking at the West Germans for a moment in, in the 50s, I think the hypocrisy of the West German position in the 50s is best exemplified by the strategic decision, which, you know, has a good amount of mid-century uh, German thinking in it to never recognize the ROC officially. And that's very much to do with economic interests in Asia. Uh, the Federal Republic tries to... Um, first in the late 50s, then in the mid 60s, again, to actually est establish official economic relations with the PRC based on the old, uh, the old um, ost uh, austrister Deutschen Wirtschaft, uh, because yes, size matters. So the bigger market is obviously the People's Republic of China and not Taiwan, which is uh, sort of comes as a blessing in Ostpolitik negotiations because the Bonn doesn't have to step back from recognizing the ROC because they never have. Uh, so, um, which again helps them uh, with Beijing to, to basically then say, well, that's different, we're not interfering here. Uh, and I think that shows you best that, yes, they, they very much use these cases when they are useful in international politics, uh, but in a way, economic interest and, and political power does matter, uh, which I, I hope I showed in the, in the talk that the moment the PSC becomes a nuclear power, it's not just a rising economic uh, market and uh, rising economic power, but it's a regional power that people just have to reckon with in different, uh, in different and new ways. Uh, and similarly, obviously, if you look at African states looking at Europe, uh, the West Germany becomes uh, or remains uh, a force to be reckoned with because West Germany has much more firepower when it comes to development aid funding to maybe you know pull people back politically from supporting the GDR. Uh, which might be in various uh, periods actually much closer to their own political beliefs uh, than than the West Germans. So, so you have these, yeah, these these aspects written into that story. Absolutely. So, if there are no more questions here or online, but we don't see any in the in the chat, do we? I mean, this first question has uh, remained there since the very beginning. Then I thank you so much for also having this discussion with us and your lecture. And I think we should applaud again to you 